Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Game Kill. I'm Navid aka Barely Average Gaming, and we are back with our streamers, with our gamers, after an intense interview that we had with Game Red. And now we have ourselves one of the legends, a true legend, a true icon of the community, that is Mr. Romero. Sir, how are we doing today? I'm doing pretty good. You know, it's been a pretty busy week. A lot of training has been going on, a lot of wrestling, a lot of jujitsu has been going on. Tomorrow, i got to run a 10K for a charity for, like, the college. So, at, like, 9 a.m. in the morning, it's going to be fun, but, man, it's going to be cold. But I'm just having fun, man. It's just been a pretty, pretty good, consistent level of happiness on this end of the spectrum. It's good to see you doing a lot of things besides MMA as well. Um, a lot of uh, viewers who are watching this must follow your Twitter as well and uh, follow the activities that you do besides uh, the gaming aspect of things. Um, also, uh, with our guest today, he is one of the one of the voices, one of the more renowned voices of that league called ESFL, one of the biggest esports fight leagues in the world right now, if not the biggest. So uh, we are going to talk a bit about his journey, a lot of things that he has shared uh, when it comes to the game itself. A few controversies in the community that have come up recently in game kill interviews so we're going to talk about that as well but before we start this interview just a quick shout out to everyone who supported the community that is game kill we are we are really uh, thankful to all the guests that we've had previously and also to the guests uh, from the Tekken community from the ufc community and also to the pakistani community that has recently engaged uh, in conversations with us so we are really, so we are really glad to see the progress that this community is making. So uh, again, GameKill is out here. It's a platform for you to showcase what you're all about, for you to get inspired by content creators, by uh, individuals like Romero, like Prioxis, like everyone else that we've interviewed. So we are going to continue this uh, process, and the only thing we are banking on is your support. So if you like content like the one we are going to see in this interview, all you have to do is press the like button, the subscribe button. The, you can comment below, whatever you want. Again, you know the drill better than I do. You watch the content. So before I say anything more, we will have our guest here speak for us. And uh, in order to do that, the question is, sir, you know, for everyone who's watched you, everyone who is a fan of you knows what you're all about. But what we need to know is where it all started. How did your journey start um, when it comes to uh, the game itself? How did you get into commentary? So just a brief uh, of your background and your history. Well, briefly, it'd be kind of hard to do, but I'll try to do my best. Well, um, the first kind of thing I saw with M MMA was like a fight between Jose Aldo and Frankie Edgar. It was their first fight. I believe it was a rerun or it might have been the actual fight being rerun. And I saw that fight and I saw those guys. So I'm like, holy crap, like these guys are like, you know, like a little bit bigger than me, but they're like doing, they're fighting. And this looks so cool. And as like a kid, you know, you watch like Dragon Ball Z, you watch like a bunch of anime, you saw that stuff. And you're like, wow, like this is real. Like somebody can really do this stuff. And then I, not long after that, a few days later, I was going by GameStop, and it might have been Undisputed 3 around that time, because this is before I started wrestling, but this is what kind of sparked my interest, and I was playing the game, and I'm like, oh, shit, like, this, this is real people, like, this is real people, like, this, yeah. it, it kind of blew my mind, because I thought boxing was cool, right, boxing's cool, everybody knew Mayweather, everybody knows Pacquiao, and all that stuff, but I just mm -hmm. thought, man, like, it's not just enough to fight without, you know, throwing somebody, kicking somebody, so that, that really got my interest, and then after that, you know, I, I he was like into some stuff back when I was younger. And a lot of my friends said, you know, wrestling would be pretty good for you. And mm -hmm. I'm like, ah, I don't know. I got, you know, like, I was like, yeah, I don't know. Like, I don't. But I tried it in uh, my, ju my junior year of high school, which is a lot of people don't believe after they see me wrestle the way I wrestle now. Uh -huh. But I tried it my junior year. Like, I did okay. And I'm like, man, I don't like losing to people. So, <laughs> like, I don't like losing to people. So, I just kind of worked my butt off. And oddly enough, through, like, my – the work I think I was ever putting through wrestling, I got more involved with MMA because a lot of the alumni from my from my the school that I went to at Rampo ended mm -hmm. up training with a lot, doing a lot of MMA guys like Marcus Serena, an alumni from my school who fights in Bellator. Mm -hmm. He went to college with Frankie Edgar, and Frankie Edgar was one of the first the two <laughs> one of the first fighters I watched, and I'm like, yeah. whoa, this is crazy! Like this is real life, mm -hmm. right? Of course. So slowly, slowly but surely, as I got better as a wrestler, I started. Mm -hmm. um, understanding like things mentally like uh, very mm. mentally just piece of things together and i'm like when i start playing games i'm like man the same things apply in like real life to this game i could be good at this game too the same way i can get better at wrestling so i just kind of look to connect the way i was learning and yeah it's paid off a lot more than i expected <laughs> i'll tell you that much all right um again uh, there there's something that you do and uh, there are at least at least in fact there are a lot of things that you do and one of them is that you are one of the premier voices of the esfl 
So uh, how did that come about? How did you uh, join ESFL? How did that process uh, initiate? Uh, kind of similar, oddly similar to how I started wrestling. You just had people like tell, tell me, hey, you should do this. Because mm. so a lot of people that are playing UFC 4 now, they're not aware of how lucky they are. And it's kind of weird. It's going to be hard to say, but people are really lucky. They didn't have to go through like the first eight months of a process of a game that wasn't, UFC 3 was literally like, in a different meta every two weeks of like constant changes, constant tuners and patches and whatnot. So mm -hmm. there, there was a lot of players that were like good at some point or some players that were like bad, a lot of exploiters that got weeded out. And I was yeah. one of those players that uh, I had a, I have a certain pride about it, and I still do. Like mm -hmm. I like to try to beep and try to beep people out their own thing, but also I'll try to play like the fighter I'm using. And that was like a key thing. So when everybody was doing certain exploits and whatnot, I just kind of, as a code of honor for myself, I'd be like, I'm not mm -hmm. doing this shit. Like, cause if this stuff gets patched out, one, it's not going to be good for me. And two, I don't feel right playing like this. Cause I'm, I'm trying to play an MMA game. I'm not yeah. trying to play Tekken or street fighter and look to do some, some something cheeky like that. Mm -hmm. And I actually ended up meeting uh, my boy, him, the dream through him, the mm -hmm. dream is how I ended up meeting Unibot. Who's one of the best players in the world period. And mm -hmm. also through him, I ended up meeting Marshall Mind. And just from that, like from me, like meeting those guys and then them seeing how I play. And as I got better over time, uh, they said, yo, you should compete in ESFL. And I was like, I'll tell you, like the first thing, I, I walked into an ESFL chat room. It was, uh, I think Ed Parker was fighting on it, right? And All I had right. just beaten him on ranked. Like I just beaten him <laughs> on ranked. And I didn't know who the hell he was. And I'm like, this guy's the main event. I just beat him like a few minutes ago. And I had a bunch of people just bombard me like, you're a liar. You know what he's beating that. Da, 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 this and, that. <laughs> and then I'm like, bro, why would I lie? Like, I just, I legit just knocked this guy out. <laughs> like, a few nights ago, like, he ain't shit. <laughs> like, I, was just, I was just telling the truth. Yeah. But uh, then I met that uh, when I matched up with him, we got in a party and he's like, oh shit, you did beat me. I'm like, no, no shit, sir. Like, yeah, I did beat you. <laughs> and then uh, we had like some good fights. Like, we went like back and forth. I'm like, all right, you're legit, legit. You should find ESFL. I'm like, mm -hmm. all right. Uni was like, I think Uni or Goat had the title. I remember seeing Goat beat Iron Sharif. And it, Iron Sharif was like at the, the prime top exploiter of all time. That dude was like really one of the worst guys to play against. And Goat beat him when a few patches got implemented. Mm -hmm. And then it started getting interesting to me because I'm like, oh, so like ESFL was like actual, mm -hmm. like these guys are actually playing the game and playing a specific meta, a certain strategies. Like these guys are going into the beat. They're not just like, mash your buttons obviously you don't mash buttons on this game but you know they're not just going in there with like oh we'll, we'll just see what happens mm -hmm. and then as i got into esfl i went three and one uh my first season i lost to literally i lost due to a bug like i was pulling a strike and uh my opponent's hook like dislocated from his uh, shoulder extended <laughs> past two ranges and knocked me out from there and i'm like what <laughs> like, i was like what like, <laughs> and then it got patched the next day i'm like are you serious and then uh, I, I came back after like two weeks and then I beat somebody who was like top 10 rank. I'm like, ah, cool, that was cool. That ESFL stuff was fun. And mm -hmm. then the second season, I actually barely competed. Like I didn't compete at all until mm -hmm. uh, Z Hunter hit me up. He's like, yo, pre-United opponent dropped out. I think he was supposed to fight Invader or somebody. Mm -hmm. Pre was a two-time ESFL champ. Mm -hmm. um, I beat, I, we, him and I went back and forth like playing times on rank championships. He's like, oh, you got like, you know, you're, you're a pretty good player. Like, can you fill in for us? I'm like, I was just coming off of like a shift from work. Like I literally, like I, my shift was almost done from work. Like I, I was in there for 10 hours. I'm like, shit, oh. let's go. Like, I was like, all right, let's go. <laughs> Called an Uber. Like I went back home. I barely mm -hmm. had a chance to get ready. I went on rank for one fight, beat some bum up. I'm like, let's do this. <laughs> and then I beat him on like short notice, literally quite literally short notice, not playing, warming up, nothing at all, basically. And I, I won and everyone was like, oh, snap. And then that gave, gave me a lot of attention to my channel. And then the ESFL took, took an even more look at me mm -hmm. and then just uh, how I guess how I carried myself a bit after I, I definitely had my rough patches early on definitely had my rough patches early on but as mm -hmm. I've kind of grown and matured they're like look we really appreciate your insight on things your how your analytical ability on things how you can break things down and like yeah. we'd really like to have you on the commentary booth and I'm like sure I'll do it like I'll do it so then my mm -hmm. first commentary was my first uh, ESFL title fight I actually did commentary for three hours <laughs> on my title fight and it was fun. It was great. Like it was cool to be like in the booth. And then like, I was commentating with Ed Parker and top man Stan and we were mm -hmm. just like, you know, just vibing, just going all of each other's stuff. Yeah. Everybody kind of knows I won that fight against Unibop, but the game's judging is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> it was like literally like one of the worst decisions yeah. ever made. But uh, it, it, overall, the experience was fun. And then after that, I was like, all right, cool. This is great. Well, um, I think one of the things that you've expanded upon is the fact that you are revered in the community for your ability to break down fight, fights, uh, find areas that uh, individuals can improve upon. And we have had your teammates uh, from your uh, dark camp, uh, like Zayaf, like uh, Crooks. And one of the biggest reasons for them to join your team is primarily their, their understanding the, the fact that there is a significant opportunity for them to improve themselves if they are under the uh, tutelage of someone like you or someone like all the individuals that you have at your camp. So I believe uh, that kind of insight is something that helps a lot of individuals. And that's one of the reasons why in the community, the culture of having camps is uh, something that has prevailed over time. So uh, again, with your history, um, with, with this game, with the camp, if you can expand a little bit more on how dark came about and how's it going so far so how dark came about so originally there we had a group called kings mma yeah and that was uh me swiss doc uni and beta we were go we were literally like a super team like a huge super team mm -hmm. and i think ed, ed was there for like a little bit and eventually you know we kind of like we're still we're very great friends but like in our own group chat we're like you know what it's it's not cool for us to all be in the same camp like, let's have some like let's have some rivalries going on. let's have like us versus this so we're like mm -hmm. all right let's do that and then mm -hmm. over time eventually went from kings and then heading into ufc4 we're like yo let's like start something new so mm -hmm. everybody thinks like i'm the leader i guess maybe it's because i'm the most vocal person right but mm -hmm. I, I don't Put, I don't ever put myself above anybody. I tell everybody, whenever it comes to any decisions that are made in the camp, I, I go to everybody, ask for their opinion. I, mm -hmm. I want to see what they're, they're standing aside. I don't rule over uh, the camp with an iron fist and make decisions. That's just not how I roll. The you know, Swiss mm -hmm. and Doc are like the two guys, like my two like brothers, you know, like they help out with that, still said decision. Swiss is a, people really sleep on that guy. But mm -hmm. it, we came together, we're like, you just want to work and like, let's be real good. Let's uh put some time into UFC four for as much as we're able to, obviously we're older, right? Like I, mm. I barely play this game. <laughs> like I barely play this game. Not because I, I didn't have the same time to play this game as much as I do UFC three, but mm. everything from UFC three transfers over to UFC four extremely well. So I probably, I've posted it plenty of times. I had people post their hours on the game and I constantly would be like the guy with the least amount of hours. And people would be like, how the hell does this guy have, at least my hours, and it's because I focus on quality as opposed to quantity. You can spend a thousand, two thousand hours playing a game, but if you're spending those two thousand hours doing the wrong thing, how is it going to help you? You're, you're constantly putting in mm. repetitions that are detrimental to your development as a player. Whereas mm. if you're playing the game for 15, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, right? And you're putting in mm. quality time and you're playing a really good player, or maybe even on like practice mode, trying to practice your timing on certain stuff. Yeah. And and then get ready for like showtime. That's more beneficial for players. And at first, I remember I used to catch a lot of flack for that. When I I used to catch a lot of flack for that. Like, dude, like you're you're just playing on practice mode or quick fire or whatever. You just don't you don't want to play as much. You think you're bougie and whatnot. I'm like, no, like I I don't. If I don't see a benefit with working with certain people, or if I'm I'm not gonna get better from it, why am I gonna do it? Get it? Mm. So and then eventually it proved itself. I I, I Marshall Mind will tell you himself. He said. Romero, like I, I can part, I can pull up a message from my phone right now. He said, I don't know. You went from a player that I could beat. Like I, I wasn't worried about beating and now I can't touch you. Like, <laughs> like now it's, it's really hard for me to like, get a win on you. And mm -hmm. that's just a testament to being consistent and being disciplined and working what you need to work on. And all the guys in the camp, whenever they have a fight coming up and I'm able to help out, if yeah. you just give me footage, like of any of who they're going to fight, um and i can i could fight find a tendency right away you give me three fights i could find a tendency right away we won't make the game plan around that said tendency but we'll be ready to take advantage of it if the opportunity arises itself mm -hmm. the whole point is neutralizing what your opponent does best and then implant and then doing what you do best so yeah, yeah the I, camp just came the camp just came about just because we wanted to work and kick some butt well i think the way you summed it up was pretty uh, was pretty decent and in fact one of the things i would want to expand just a little bit more on is what you said specifically about quality over quantity so a lot of times and in fact this is one of the things with which we uh, ended up having some sort of a controversy with one of the members of the community which i shall not name but um, the, the the entire construct was about 
uh, how much is grind involved in something? How, how much time should you spend on something till you get better at it? So I think one of the things that you said uh, really struck a chord with me, and that is you have to focus on doing the right things when you are spending that kind of time. If, because if you're spending two hours doing the right thing and understanding what needs to be fixed, I think it's going to be more uh, fru fruitful for you in the long run. So maybe for a lot of individuals who are doing things when they're doing it, it's perfectly fine to grind it out. It's perfectly fine to put your time and put your efforts in, but you have to have the mindfulness. You have to have the understanding that while you're doing all of that, that you also have to be very mindful of what's going on around you. What you what what are the things that you're improving, and what are the things that are not necessarily uh, having the right amount of pace uh, when it comes to improving uh, improvement in those skills. So um, it's very important to have uh, a realist approach, so to say, for a few of things that you're not necessarily. Um, improving rapidly on and understand why it's important. And also um, with camps, uh, one of the things that I believe you've just mentioned is the ability to have different mindsets and different perspectives, which can uh, help you understand the things that um, you as a fighter may have missed uh, in the heat of the moment, or perhaps in your preparation for a fight. So if you have someone like uh, yourself or someone like Swiss or, or uh, someone like Zaf, who are, who are different skills, uh, who have uh, different skill sets when it comes to the fight game. So they can pick apart an opponent very in a different manner and then create a strategy based on uh, uh, your tendencies and perhaps the things that you need to focus on. So um, I believe that's one of the biggest uh, things that a camp serves. And at the same time, we, we're seeing a bit of a shift in the culture. Um, there are a few camps out there. Again, uh, we may name them or we may not. Let's see how uh, it flows. But uh, you have camps popping up out of nowhere, having a hype for a few days, uh, getting on the scene, and they're just breaking apart completely after a few days. Um, one of those camps, um, again, I think you borrowed crooks from one of them. If I'm not missing, I'm not going to name the, name the camp, but um, that happened. And also um, an interesting development that is, um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if you know this, but I'm sure. And I, I think inter if you're active in the community, you're definitely aware that Ed Parker joined T4H. So there's a lot of movement happening in the community. But when you look at a camp in your definition as someone who, I wouldn't call a leader, but someone who's a senior member of a camp. So. Your, your approach towards the camp would be very different towards, let's say, someone who is very materialistic in theirs or someone who has short-term gains in mind. So what's your gain? What, what, what keeps you motivated to be a part of the camp? Well, I like to see my friends succeed. That's kind of like the big thing about it. Like I'm yeah. more, because the thing is, I've already accomplished what I wanted to accomplish, right? Like I've done what I wanted to do. So which is why I'm like, damn, all right, I did that. And mm -hmm. Right now, there's not much for me to do other than help out other people and help them get better at the game, not just my camp members, but the yeah. whole reason I started my channel was because I, I, real, I realized I could see certain things better than other people. And it takes a certain level of humility to recognize what you're not good at and then try to take the time to improve upon that. And then once you have that, that growth mindset that can help you get to where you want to mm -hmm. be and you believe in the effort to do so. Mm -hmm. it, it goes a long way and with the camp you know I, I like to help these guys out like I, these guys are they're good they're good friends they're good people help crooks and i at one point we didn't we didn't like each other at one point right and now he's in he's in my camp crazy how the world works yeah but um his swiss used to kick my ass all the time on unc3 <laughs> like these like it's stuff it's stuff that works together right but when they're when it's time for him to go to war you can ask Zayaf. i don't i don't play i won't play the game for like god knows how long i'm, I'm really focused on what i what i aim to do is just to win the first national title for my college but I will take time out of my day to help out this kid, continue to help help him defend the title because I may have done what I want to do, but this kid wants mm -hmm. to continue to do what he wants to do. And what type of person would I be if I have all the tools to help out this kid continue do continue to you know break barriers, you know set records? Like, of course I want to be a part of it. I want to help him out. And same thing with Swiss. You know, Swiss just had a Swiss. He's he's doing great in real life, and then virtually barely barely been playing he comes in he beats the guy who won the two grand tournament right he beats death punch he KOs him in round three right so like and then it, it crooks he had a an, an incredible summer like incredible summer he's always yeah. been a good player since UC3 and then mm -hmm. now he's putting together that level of consistency doc has obviously always been good as well you mm -hmm. know sometimes we take our breaks from the game but just because we're taking a break doesn't mean we're not 
staying in there. We're not giving each other advice and helping each other. So it's really more so about my friends than myself. And mm -hmm. maybe in, in that sense, it could kind of be like, look, because I, I generally want to help them because these people are good people. Zayef is an exception because obviously he's not around our age. He's 16. This mm -hmm. kid was literally like my little brother. Like this kid was like a li little brother following me around everywhere. The kid would just comment on everything. Like, oh my God, <laughs> like, he <would> just be <laughs> following me everywhere. But the kid, he showed that he was willing to learn. And yeah. I remember that in myself because before I became big friends with Marshall Mind, mm -hmm. I was that kid on like end stage of UC2, like oh, watching Marshall Mind's videos, right? Mm -hmm. And then like maybe a little bit of UC3 watching his videos and whatnot, trying to get better, trying to get like that. And mm -hmm. that, not about, for me, it wasn't about the size because I wanted to prove that I can get to that skill level. I can, I can say, you know, subscriptions, I love, I love my subscribers, right? Because they're, I love my subscribers. But I'm saying like, in terms of numbers, like I'm not trying to beat this guy to try to steal his subs. No, I want to see yeah. if I can get to the a level of respect with my skill level and, and earn that. And that's what that kid wanted to do. And he's he's definitely earned it and he's done it. So yeah, it's cool to see it flourish. Like it's really cool to see that stuff happen. Yeah, I think one of the things that a lot of people in the community don't necessarily realize is that there's enough sunshine for everyone. I mean, if, mm -hmm. if there's a person who has a subscriber, that, that doesn't mean that that person cannot subscribe to another channel. So, mm -hmm. I mean, there, there is a certain level of competitiveness in, in this community that at times can be toxic, uh, at times can be very, very healthy. But more often than not, uh, what's ugly, what's uh, toxic gets more highlighted than anything else. So what's your perspective on this community? I mean, um, again, this is something that we've uh, spoken about quite rampantly when it comes to game kill, and that is uh, the UFC community itself ha has the potential of matching what UFC, the growth of UFC is all about. Like that company was, that was not even worth $4 million is now worth over $4 billion. And, and, and the valuation just, keep, uh, just keeps on growing. So it's going to attract global audience. So why is it that a game uh, or a sport, so to say, that is attracting so much attention has an esports that is uh, not even scratching the surface of its true potential? So is, is, it, is it something that the community has to fix? Is it down to the game? What is it that you think needs to be improved? It's a group effort, and I'll expand upon that. So yeah. one, I'll, I'll say the community for last. So for EA, mm -hmm. right? EA yeah. has recently realized that, okay, we can get money, like we can generate more money. This is the, the third best selling game. I don't know a lot of people know that. For mm -hmm. all the negativity that people say, right? And yeah. Remember, I'm a game changer. That's something, I ain't breaking no NDA saying that. That's like, you can literally look that shit up. So, <laughs> but this is their third best selling game. The problem is it comes down to them properly implementing what we, the community want to put together, right? And then don't worry, I'll get on that a little bit later. But as of lately, right, UFC 3 didn't have any esports events, right? Even though UFC 3 is leads, leads better than UFC 2, um, they could, there wasn't enough of a push for UFC 3. And Zach Hunter, you know, Z Hunter, did a, a phenomenal job and everybody else with the staff around mm -hmm. him to help gather that connection with the actual UFC and, ES, and in creating ESFL and then providing a platform for players to showcase their skill. Because that's, that's really what a lot of players want to do. They want to prove that you're the, one of the best players out there. Yeah. And yes, you can do that. And that's that's a great opportunity. As of, in terms of esports and money, you know, like this is the most money that's been given out in general. Like I, in this year itself, it's the most money that's been given out total mm -hmm. with, considering the summer events and everything else. The issue is, is continuing that momentum. Now yeah. with the community, the issue with the community is that it comes down to ego because a lot of people are more concerned with being better than the other person. I, I this is the thing is, I don't believe, I know I don't believe that there is one singular player that is better than everybody else. I don't believe that. And I've, mm -hmm. I've asked since around the end of UC3 actually, there's, you're going to have better days. Everybody can have a better day than a set player, but there's not, there's not a single player that can blow every single other top player out of the water on okay. one day. And there, there's, it's not, it's never happened. It has never happened. The closest person doing that was Bartholomew on USA 3. So now that you know that, right? Now, so throw that out the way. Mm. When it comes to ego, right? Why do we have people that are attacking other people's chant? Like, you know, why do we have, for example, I'll say Marshall Mind, right? He's a, the one of the, he's probably the, the voice of like the USA community, right? Why did, um, and I'm just going to go an example because it's going to go back and forth yeah. with Parley, right? Yeah, Marsh and mine, Prox, they respect each other a lot. They know each mm -hmm. other. They speak to each other a lot, right? So mm -hmm. you see that these two content creators have respect for one another, right? Mm -hmm. So why is it that their fans, some versions of their fans, they 
collude against each other and then they just go into the other person's channel and then talk shit for no reason, whether it be because mm -hmm. of Marshall Mind beating Pry on Ace of Oak Gaming or Pry uh, saying something about something about a system. And then yeah. the first reaction for some reason in this community is to act extremely negative and then just completely, they'll regurgitate stuff because mm -hmm. they only understand it at a face value level. And they yep. really don't know what they're talking about. They're just hearing somebody else who has a platform and they're just repeating it without actually clarifying what they actually need to know. And that's where the, the egos and wanting to be right. Wanting, well, I just want to make sure I'm right all the time, right? And it, it shouldn't be the case. We should all be working together and then mm -hmm. providing a solution, providing solutions on top of solutions, figuring out why these problems exist in the first place. Mm -hmm. And then the, when the community gets better at understanding and then relaying that information to the developers who make this game, mm -hmm. Now you have, all right, content creators, community being not just the top players, the average mm. players, the below average players, the casual players, the players that play rank for 23 hours a day, like those players coming together saying, look, for all of our experience, we want EA to push this game in this set direction. Now that we understand how certain things work, instead of mm. getting at each other's throats, worrying about something petty as who's better than this, how about focus on directing that energy into providing meaningful feedback that's going to yeah. help us get a better game through? And it's not mm -hmm. going with extreme negativity, especially when a business, when a business can, they can literally just call up and go, you know what? We're going to put in unicorns in UFC 5. Who's going to stop us, right? Yeah. Because I had, I had Joe Schmo on Twitter say he's going to threaten to kill my family because mm -hmm. I because uh this fighter's not in the game right like how does how it's ridiculous right yeah and you don't want to have that back and forth it has to be like a unity type of thing so it's it's tough it's gotten better right relaying like it's gotten better certain things have happened especially over the past few months that's put a dent into the developer community relationship and a lot of it's come down to ego but the sooner that the community itself realizes that remember like these guys they're the developers right some of them might not, might not even be fans of mma not everybody's jeff Howard who's truly passionate about the sport mm. of mma yeah. but sometimes they legit don't know they're just putting in numbers and they just want to know what works and what's going to give them money what's going to provide their mm. income for their family and yeah. whatnot but also the player base what are they going to want to spend their time with they want to spend their time with a good game you get two parties working together well now you can see the bigger money right so the e mm. so the usc esports you know we got like 300k 400k views on the, the total thing for like the esports thing, right? That's huge. That's huge. Yeah. Right. And that's not even like the best of what the game has to offer. Mm. And we can continue to expand upon that. But now, especially because you know, it's pretty clear that this is, game is coming to like the end cycle of it. Or there's gonna be in, in some matter of time or what, we're gonna hear something about the next game, right? Mm. Yeah. And now are we gonna the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again? Are we gonna have this community just go back into complaining, complaining? Or they're going to figure out, all right, why is this working like this? What can we tell them to fix this and why? Like, why, how, and this is how we're going to do it. And it's, it's more so really, basically, TRDR, be more proactive, be less reactive. That, that's what the community has to be. Be less, more proactive, less reactive, and stop trying to kill each other in common sections. It's so unnecessary. I think one of the reasons why there is a, a lot of scrutiny when it comes to UFC related games or any combat related games is the fact that uh, there are a lot of stigmas that combat esports or just combat in general uh, uh, is considered to be. I mean, a few years ago, you had legislation happening in America considering it as cockfight. So when you have those stigmas attached to uh, esports, uh, sorry, to, to MMA, when there are games that are coming out of it, you don't necessarily have to have the same bravado translating into esports because again that's a video game that is absolutely unrelated to what's going on in the real mma i mean it's a game simulator we get that but at the same time you acting like jake paul without having the resources the the, uh, the clout or even the backing or or the fine or perhaps the finances that these guys have so maybe if you're doing it just to have a vicarious out-of-body experience of what these guys are doing i mean uh, that's another thing that I feel a lot of people try to replicate and try to live, uh, or at least feel like what, what, what it feels like. So, and also another thing is that a lot of people, like you said, a lot of egos involved, at least when it comes to the gameplay, uh, when you're fighting someone in the game, obviously one of the players has to lose, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there is a physical inability there. There are, there are a hundred of factors that comes in, especially when you're playing online. I mean, 
we have not had a single LAN event for UFC, at least uh, officially. So you cannot necessarily say one player is better, one's, one's not, because like you said, you can have off days, you can have bad days, you can, you can have a storm like I do right now and uh, have, a, have a horrible connection. But um, I think what has to come down to the community, like you said, uh, has, to be pro- uh, has to be mindfulness. Uh, about what's what's really happening, what uh, you know, the influencers, like you said, uh, the, the developers, the people who are who are the key decision makers, uh, they don't necessarily see why you're aggressive, but they see the aggression itself. They they will not see the reason why you're screaming, but they'll see that you're being violent, you're being hostile, and considering the fact that you're a part of a community that was quote unquote at one time called uh, uh, human cockfighting. So that is going to invoke negative emotions towards uh, the community itself. So you have to disassociate yourself. If you want to create disassociation, there has to be positivity. There has to be collaboration. There has to be communication um, on all levels. And um, again, I think with individuals like yourself, with individuals like you mentioned, like Martial Minds, like Prioxys, like all the content creators that are out there, I think they're doing an excellent job. So instead of trying to pit them uh, against each other, what the focus has to be, where do we go from there? How do we elevate each other? How do we uh, step on the shoulders of the giants and make our content even better? So perhaps that's my two cents on uh, all of the situation. And uh, one of the things you mentioned, I think this is another thing that I want to expand on, uh, is uh, your contribution as a game changer. Um, again, there are certain things that you're not allowed to say uh, considering your uh, non-disclosure agreement. But how was that experience like? How how was it for you as a as a player and now as a contributor to the community? Hmm. All right. <laughs> so the funniest thing I always hear is like, "Oh, you're a game changer. You're supposed to be good at the game." And it's kind of like, no, because I wasn't a game changer. Because when I before I was a game changer, I was a good player. So that that those two don't care. <laughs> we have game changers that aren't good players that are there mm. because they're able to provide a certain facet of knowledge. And whether it be an area of like, uh, like I said, like, you know, certain sales or certain things when it comes to character models, things that may, you and I may not be able to understand, but they understand how to hit the ones and zeros and all that type of stuff, right? Mm. So it's, I, I'll, I'll be quite honest, it's quite, quite frustrating, right? It's, it's good to see things in, in the back end, but then it can be really frustrating when you know when it, something's going to be an issue you're aware and uh, there's a lot of things I've called issues about way months prior Mm -hmm. way like months before it became an issue and then it doesn't get resolved until much later and but the damage is kind of already done and that that kind of that that's something that always hurts me a little bit on the bright side though I've been if you ask any of the game changers uh you can ask Balian I'm a boxer you can ask Kinetic you can ask Demar you can ask Marshall you can ask who else is actually in there Arrow you can basically all, all all the the game changers are like still somewhat active there, right? They say, who's the most active guy? Hello, I am. I'm, I'm the most active guy in there. Yeah. And I'll bring in examples and whatnot from my real life fights. I'll do everything that I can to try and say, all right, why can't we have this? And I understand there's certain things I now know, like, all right, we can't have this because this works in this specific way because we have this specific engine, right? And then Brian Hayes on the Xbox uh, he was doing an Xbox interview, so he's the head, the lead developer, right? Yeah. He openly said, you know, we're looking to get a new engine for the next game. Like he openly said that. Mm-hmm. So ideally, if that's the case, that can now open up a door for more stuff that maybe before couldn't be done before. It's never as simple. People would like to think that it's as simple as like, look, we can just press this button and we can revert this to this. It's a matter of um, them applying their resources resources the right way, which I very vocally <laughs> have said, I'm not the happiest of how they handle the resources, especially with how the game was initially going. I think it's pretty common knowledge, right? I had a whole petition out against the creative fighters thing, like for rank championships, I had EA send me like a letter. <laughs> like they're like, hey bro, you gotta chill. I was like, no fam, I ain't gonna chill at all. Like you didn't speak in my mind, bro. <laughs> like I ain't bring no NDA, I'm speaking my mind. So it's uh you know like just because i'm in a position that's like all right i'm with the like i'm with EA doesn't mean i'm just gonna kiss their boots and whatnot and not say what i'm gonna say but if i'm gonna come at them a certain way i'm going to come at them with facts i'm gonna come with actual facts i'm not gonna just look at something say this doesn't work and you yell facts like no that's not how it works Mm -hmm. you have to actually have some form of substantial evidence as to why this is not working and then you have to provide even more evidence as to how you're going to make this 
work in gameplay. From yeah. for like, for example, like uh the Jaffe body straight, like that meta like ruined UFC three, in my personal opinion. I was one of the best players on there. That game like ruined the game for like for a lot of guys because the game is predicated on that threat. And it took forever for that to get removed the UFC, like got removed the UFC four, and then there's still some faint exploits still running around. So it's like, ah, oh, like, can you just do it all in one? But uh, but it's frustrating, but then it's like cool, it's like ah, uh, all right. Like my girlfriend, like she'll see me like sometimes I'll be on my phone. I'm just like, like uh, I'll dance just be like this. Bro. Like, hey, what happened? My fucking like, I was spawning 30 minutes. So, uh. But then other days I'll be like, oh shit, oh let's go. Like I just be hyped because I got I mean I got some good news or something. But it's like almost anything else. Like I don't let this uh the position of being a game changer, it doesn't define me. You know, it's something I acquired along the way here on this journey. And I think anybody who's played me recently, like I, I I have barely been playing, right? And I only lose to really good players, like who are my friends generally, right? Like I'm like, look, if I'm only losing to guys who are like other extremely elite players and I barely been playing this game, I'm fine where I'm at. Like I don't have anything else to prove. So it's just fun. Yeah, I think um, one of the things you mentioned specifically about Game Changers is the fact that uh, we need individuals um, because a lot of times the fact that you have developers, you have gamers, you have big corporations who have a certain way that they operate. Again, there are certain inhibitions, there are certain, um, you would say, obstacles, like you mentioned, a new engine for the new game. So there, there is a lot of empathy that you you will have towards the developers. But at the same time, like you mentioned, there would be frustration uh, when it comes to some things that could have been solved at the right time, but the solution wasn't uh, like the, the right the right option wasn't select, selected for it. So yeah, I think uh, perhaps for a lot of people, I uh, it's really good to hear uh, your perspective on things because um, from the outside looking in, it might not look like um, it's uh, there is a lot of contribution or perhaps uh, uh, maybe I think I heard something something in the community uh, being talked about, and that is that despite of these game changers, there's nothing much that the community has seen evolve. It's not that the, it's not being said, but at the same time, uh, what has to be understood is the fact that everyone who's contributing isn't necessarily hurt 100% of the time because uh, of A, B, C, or whatever reasons that they have. So, I mean, there's a lot of responsibility on the shoulders of these guys as they're the representatives of the community, but simultaneously do understand that the position that they're, they're in so have some empathy, have some uh, perspective on that as well. Um, you had something to say on that, I, I believe. Yeah, it's also because like, it's it's again, it's like people kind of like regurgitating what they hear. It's like, well, yeah. if the game changers didn't do anything, we would be stuck here. You'll see four wouldn't never have taken off. We would be stuck with exactly how it came out. Like it, there's so many fixes that got through because of the game changers pushing yeah. through what the community is asking for. So what you say, what the what the app most good portion of the community says, we hear that stuff. We're not robots. We we mm. see that stuff. Yeah. And we look into like, is this actually something that's messed up? Is this actually something that's busted? All right, we're gonna try our best to try to see why is this working like this way. Um, yeah, but like the freaking standing gates, it's forever to fix that thing. It was fixed in one moment. God, Jesus Christ, horrible. I hate that. It's horrible. I use it once though against I use it once though against <laughs> against uh, bathing ash because I, I really disliked him at the time. And he went off of a bug flying knee, and I was very petty. And then he was just talking a lot of trash. He's like, you know what? I was gonna beat you, I was gonna just humiliate you for four rounds, but now you don't even deserve that level of respect from me. I'm gonna choke <laughs> you out. And just to show the devs that I'm going to submit a high-level player who's never gotten submitted before in competition by this move and i'm not like i'm okay at choke sub uh choke subs i'm okay like I, i'm okay i'm really good at joint subs but i'm okay at the choke sub mini game and that mm -hmm. was one of the things where it was like oh yeah we probably should fix that standing guillotine i'm just like yeah you think i was telling <laughs> you about it for weeks but you didn't believe me it's kind of it, it's it's tough it's tough and mm -hmm. it, it's just hmm. another thing that kind of comes with that too it's just it's hard for us to have be open with certain bits of information about risking the whole NDA stuff, but which is why I try to do my best to like, the more I can get people from my channel or people from other people's channel to understand why this works the way it does. Like mm -hmm. it, when it comes to striking, head movement. I remember I'll hear people, they'll go, but they'll go, let me see, where my controller at? 
Bro, I keep pressing triangle and this button and my head move. This game sucks. My thing's first of my bro. <laughs> you're not countering because you're holding on to the R2 for too long. And then you're trying to counter with your head movements on and you're holding left stick forward. So your character's going forward and you're not allowing it to stay planted so you can hit the set counter. Five minutes later, the guy's hitting slip counters. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Boom. Magic, right? Yeah. Sometimes you got to take a step back, realize what you're doing wrong and be like, oh, that's what I do. I do it all the time. Like I do it all the time, whether it be wrestling, jiu-jitsu, or even in, like in a game when I play and I, I'll catch myself in the act of doing something. I'll be like, yeah. damn, I, I, I was doing this this entire time. So instead of being mad, like instead of like being mad, I'm like, God damn, maybe you could be frustrated or like I could have performed better. But it's like, damn, I was doing this a lot and that's nobody's fault but my own. So mm-hmm. I think if the more knowledge, that's what I said, the more knowledge, actual uh sustain what the hell is that a cat okay sustainable knowledge for the community to follow through with right you know like they can't understand it so then when all the high level players are talking about stuff nobody's left out in the dark i hate that like i really dislike that when mm-hmm. when uh i know in uc2 a lot of high level players they kept information for themselves and deliberately hid it from lower level players and that's mm-hmm. what those are all the guys in this division seven division eight and now compared to the now uc3 uc4 everybody almost knows everything about everything which is great yeah. Like, that's great. You want the community to start out at the exact same level playing field. There should be no way. I should have not had to figure out half the stuff I had to figure out on my own, to be quite honest with you. I shouldn't mm-hmm. have to figure out this track, this move track, this pull, or this is this. I've, I've, I figured out a lot of stuff. Yeah. But I think it's unfair because, you know, not everybody's going to think the same way I do or some of the way the other good players do, mm-hmm. right? Some guys just, they legit want to go on tutorial and they have everything listed there. So at the very least, they can say, well, I didn't, I read it. I didn't understand it. I'm trying my best. Okay, I can help you. But when they literally say, well, the game didn't tell me I could do that. That's a problem. So yeah, just kind of going off of that. Yeah, I mean, some t- uh, more often than not, you have to take responsibility for your own actions. I think that kind of, it kind of boils down to, I mean, because um, I think a lot of times, considering the fact, like you mentioned, there's a lot of ego involved. It's very hard to take a deep look into the mirror and, really raise your hand and say, I messed up. But instead, I think it's very easy to shoulder blame on something else. And that's another thing that, uh, again, is something that not just even as a, as a player, but as a human being, you have to realize. And um, another thing that I've picked up that you've mentioned is the fact that a lot of times it's very easy to identify a problem. I mean, it's probably the easiest thing to do as a human being is to tell what's, what's not working out for you. It's another thing altogether to... Uh, have a suggestion as to how you can fix it. And if you don't have a suggestion, it's very, it, it makes your uh, claim very baseless. And also if you're giving someone um, a way, uh, they, in fact, if you're telling someone that they're doing something wrong, they're automatically going to go on a defensive. But as soon as you give them a suggestion, if you give them something to work on, they will, uh, it, will it will change their mind. It, uh, at least in 90% of uh, the experiences that I've faced, especially as a corporate trainer. This is something that I've seen working hands. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, in fact, in real life, this is something that I've seen play out over and over. So again, um, perhaps shout out to you and all the game changers who are doing this for the community. Again, I believe to convince developers that something is not working and needs to be fixed will require a lot of determination, a lot of effort, and also a lot of persistence on your end. So again, I believe uh, the due credit that has not been uh, given to all the game changers it's uh it needs needs to be spelled out needs to be called or at least at game kill uh we believe the recognition needs to be there um another thing that uh needs to be recognized is our previous interview with a player named sekwar that was one of the more fun interviews he's a good friend in person but i believe there was a certain instance that happened in ufc3 um there was a tournament on your channel and uh, a certain haptic feedback came up and uh, the whole thing went to shit basically <laughs> so what happened <laughs> what's your perspective on things uh it's not a perspective i'm just gonna go through the facts but um <laughs> it's, it's not a perspective it's like it's just the facts of the situation all right what's wrong? all right all right so i'd say um how do i say this right it's basically haptic feedback right so i i'd, I'd like to think that most humans at, at least to some extent if you're a normal human being you'd have some kind of core value and i understand Winning is a is a very, very, a lot of people want to win. They want to win. And sometimes they'll do things that they'll regret later on. 
right? But they'll do it because they want to win, right? So haptic feedback was something that EA, you know, this is something that they implemented for, and it was out of goodwill to help out players that maybe they're vi not obviously blind, blind, but visually impaired, and they have a hard time. Or, yeah, I can't see the screen clearly. That's why they have that uh, alternate color scheme where like some people they can't see red and blue. So they have to, it's purple, it's purple and orange for us, but it might be a completely different color for them, right? So that was implemented for, for, to help those people who are visually impaired to, you know, help them, you know, react a little bit better to fights. The problem was, you know, you can't exactly go around asking somebody to prove if they're visually impaired or whatnot, but people had taken it upon themselves nefariously to uh, use haptic feedback as some ways to predict what was going on, right? So uh, you could take this, right? And what would happen is, right? It literally instants before a strike is thrown, right? So the game yeah. is, here's the thing, 50-50, uh, people only say that to the grappling. That implies it's striking as well. It's either low or high. It's low or high. It's not yeah. body or legs. It's low or high. So when mm -hmm. the game is telling you, this guy's going low, all you got to do is low no block. This guy's going high, all you got to do is high block. So, and if you're somebody who can already see that stuff and you're giving that preemptive boost to see, to do something defensively and not of your own reaction, but you're getting assisted help, that to me, not only undermine the integrity of like a player base, like even to me, that's even lower than like, you can have somebody fish for certain stuff. Like that's not exactly the best thing to do in the game, right? Obviously mm -hmm. if I did certain things like that, people wouldn't watch my channel because they come to see me for certain content. But I think that, me personally, I'm like, dude, like you're not, it's like, it's kind of like, uh, take robbing somebody's handicap, handicap freaking a card and then putting it in your, as your own, like, dude, you're not handicapped. Why are you in the handicap parking spot? Right. So this player was, uh, there was, there was a bit of suspicion because, you know, it wasn't, it was kind of hard. I was trying to be very impartial at first. I was trying to be very impartial and I'm like, oh my God, this guy's being Swiss. Right. But it, it just, something was kind of off to me. And I'm like, this guy is legit blocking almost everything that Swiss does. And I can't even do that. Like, and I'm, I, being him playing times of comedy, he's being me playing times, right? So I'm like, this is like, something's off here, right? And this, and then I believe Nico Goat was the one that said, hey, this guy's using haptic feedback, right? And I'm like, oh my God, this guy's using haptic feedback. I'm going to lose my shit. <laughs> and then, you know, there's a whole video, there's a whole rage video, Ronald yeah, yeah. did. Shout out Ronald. And uh, basically, we got the guy stream that he was streaming it and we had him stop the action and then when we went to the settings he, he was delaying it because he was realizing oh this is uh uh oh like uh oh and then uh, he took out the hot day he had to have to feed that and he tried to turn it off but it was already on it was already, so it already showed us it was on and so then we were like all right bro you dq'd and then you know swiss was like no let me beat him up and like just to prove, prove a point right so then they, they restarted the fight and it was crazy because then I went to this player who looked like he was God's gift to himself. He was blocking everything just on point. And he was just getting absolutely dismantled. He was getting handled. Like, like he didn't belong there. <laughs> like he, it looked like he, he was never at that skill level in the first place. And that's what was extremely egregious to me, that people would go that far just to win. You know, just, just to win, you're going to go and uh, do that, like, I don't, I, shit, I don't understand. I've heard people like letting other people play on their accounts to rank up points or whatnot. Hey, honestly, that, like, I don't care about rank championships like that. That's just you racking up points or something. But money's involved. Like, this is money involved, right? You're, you're trying to beat somebody with money involved. And this is how low you're willing to go to use something that's not even meant for able-bodied individuals. This is for the disabled. And that's what really, like, disgusts me about the situation. I think um, being a devil's advocate in this conversation, there's um, another perspective that Fabio actually added, and that is uh, the fact that when you talk about a console like PS5, uh, a lot of promotion around it is based around haptic feedback. So his perspective is, and even though I understand your point, and I think this is something, I, and in fact, I know what your answer is going to be to this, is the fact that there's some, if there's something that the game has given you or provided you, uh, that technically it's not illegal to use it if it's given to you by the game. However, uh, on from an ethical standpoint, there, there can be a debate. Uh, so where do you draw the line um, when it comes to these things? Uh, especially when I, I my perspective to this, uh, before you answer this, would be if there's money involved, then the rules belong to the house. Um, as simple as that. Uh, what, what do you think? 
Well, also, it's great that you brought up the ethical because I've actually been doing a lot of study on uh, Kierkegaard's ethical, like the ethical, the aesthetic, and the religious way of belief. That's actually cool you brought it up. Mm -hmm. so his point is saying that because it's in the game i can use it but the thing is it is he's dancing around the part that this is in the game for these said individuals the only reason mm -hmm. monetarily speaking they're unable to stop other people who don't have it is because they don't have the money to have somebody have like a scanning resource card to prove yeah. that they're that they're like this but it's implicitly stated in the instructions that it's for the visually impaired. It, it's literally, it's not that, hey, half the feedback is here. If it was there, everybody would be using it, right? If it was there, mm. everybody would have been using it and it's fine and fine and dandy, but that's not the case. And also like for how that haptic feedback worked in the game, mm. the way it worked in the game for, a com for on a competitive level is what made it wrong. Haptic feedback on a controller for this, when I'm playing God of War, and I'm getting hit by a freaking behemoth for a mammoth, right? And then the controller vibrates, it show me I'm getting hit. Or have, yeah. that, have the feedback saying a little vibration. Mm. It's not telling me, hey, the, the mammoth is going to hit me. And even if it did, I probably might get misdirection or whatnot. But that's not, you know, I'm saying like a free-to-play game. Like, you feel the vibrations, right? That's you get shot. part of the aesthetic of the game, basically, yeah. Yeah, it's part of the aesthetic of the game. That's a, It's not granting you a competitive edge over mm. anybody. It's yeah. helping you. It's, it's literally help you get immersed. Like you get hit by Kratos' freaking uh, chaos or you're going against Zeus or, what, or whatever, right? Like, so you find, oh my God, like perfect example. When the mother, mother goddamn snake, <laughs> goddamn snake came out the water. <laughs> Yo, that snake came out the water, bro. My lights were off. I was like, my control was like, I'm like, yo, and I'm looking at my screen, bro. But it, it made me feel like, yo, this dude is coming out here and he about to me up, right? But this uh, but in that case, they kind of destroy its own point. It's it, yeah, it's in the game for the same people, and it says that in the instructions. So your point is entirely valid. If you go and use that, you don't have ethics. Like you don't have an ethical code that you follow. I I have my own ethical uh, code that I follow even in gaming. Like yeah. that's costing me wins, right? But I follow mm -hmm. it. Like I follow it because I just believe I want to do certain things a certain way. That's just how I am. Yeah. And I don't expect everybody to be like me. But at the mm. very least, dude, it's for the it's for the visually impaired, bro. Like, don't don't try to justify. It. You made your mistake. Move on. Afuera. All right. I think what it boils down to is common decency at the very least. So again, for everyone watching, even if that experience consciously or unconsciously, the details from uh, I think Fabio's perspective is pretty evident in his interview with us. He explained the whole ordeal in his opinion. So um, again, uh, he understands that it's wrong, but at the same time. If it was intentional, I believe uh, now everyone's aware of what's going on. So it's much more easier. And I think that particular event highlighted what, uh, what, what could be, because for a lot of people who weren't using it before, just got to know, like I did not know about haptic feedback prior to that particular event, to be honest. And uh, again, yeah, sorry. Yeah, and also just a case in point, it, it, the fact that it, it allowed a skill gap to be closed, like you would you would have to, you knew it was unhealthy for gameplay in general because now you're Absolutely. working your, you you know you'd have to work your entire play style to interrupt it. So like how I would figure it out is because the one work around around it was to faint. Like you had to faint heavily to disrupt somebody's haptic feedback because the game would not register faints as a, it wouldn't tell the person that oh that faint is not a real strike. So if you fainted low, they were controller would vibrate. So I would literally aim to vibrate the hell out of their controller and just like constantly yeah. throw faints. And it's try to have to, you're like pretty much forced to try and win decisions unless you get them down to the ground if you can sub them. So mm -hmm. it, it was really bad. And it fixed it in UC4 for the most part. But yeah, it's pretty, it was, yeah, it just comes down to that. It just ain't right. So yeah, I, I, I think uh, in terms of what you said, I, I completely agree with your opinion on this. And um, there's another thing that I think we can agree upon is that your community on YouTube is awesome. And um, your content creation is something that you've been, you've done for quite a while. So um, in terms of content creation, what's your approach towards it? Because um, your content, uh, I, I'm not sure for the lack of a better term, it's inconsistent when it comes to like a certain genre of content that you post. But again, the, the kind of uh, response that you get, get against the videos is something else. So how do you go and how do you approach content creation? So initially, 
because again, like poor kid living down, you know, poor kid, just like, you know, small little college athlete. When I was kind of, it was kind of tough, kind of figuring out certain things. But I knew I had a certain system I wanted to follow. So initially, it came down to all right, I want to be able to explain certain things so that other people can see things the way I do, and hopefully, it will help them get better at their game, at their uh, their game style, and how they choose to you know, mm-hmm. how they choose to play the game and how they choose to have an experience. There's nothing better. Like, dude, there's nothing better than having a really good fight with somebody who's also just as good as you and you lose, but it's just like, ah, damn, that was, damn, that was a really good fight. Like I had fun doing that. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And like, that, that's yeah. fun. Like, it's like, it's more than the wins or losses. Like, damn, man, like that was fun. I want to go back and play the game again. And mm-hmm. a lot of people, when they play with me, that's the consistent response that I get from them. They're like, dude, like, Monty is somebody who hates UFC four, but he's like, dude, I played a few and I feel like I love the game. I'm like, oh, <laughs> is maybe just I don't know. But yeah. back to the point of content creation, I, I think uh, the the hard part with the inconsistency about it is because of the scheduling. And I think the hardest thing for me was because it's a, it was kind of tough to juggle. Like I was process of becoming one of the best players in the world, and I'm trying to get better, then getting better at wrestling. You know, trying to get better at wrestling. You know, qualifying twice for nationals is cool, but I lost. Right, like I lost. I qualified. In, mm-hmm. And I have a third of the experience of every other college athlete, right? Everybody's been doing it since they were two, three, four years old. I didn't start wrestling until my junior year high school. And mm-hmm. I've closed a significant gap on a lot of people, but my focus was not there. And then that kind of goes into like the content creation. Like I need to have a direct focus. But so once I started getting things in order for that, they started aligning a lot better. So my focus for content creation is just helping I don't want to do too many clickbait videos. That's not me. I, I don't like mm. clickbait videos. I want my content to be content that once I upload this one video, you can come back to this video as a reference. Mm. Hell, some, yeah. uh, sometimes yeah. I catch myself <laughs> coming back to a video. I'm like, damn, how the hell did I hit this? I'm like, wait, I made a video on this. And then I'll look back. Marshall will do that. He will do that. Like, they, they'll just look, uh, oh, I forgot about this. And that's what I want. I want sustainability. I, want, I don't want to keep dragging people on for something Mm -hmm. that should be what I feel should be basic information for everybody to have. So that's why when you see me drop a counter-strike in volume one and two, like where's volume three, four, five, my bro, that's, that's everything you had to know. (laughs) Like (laughs) like if if you want me to make a, a, if you want me to make, and I I tell people to speak to me, like I'll I'll do polls in my community section, like, Hey, like, what do you want in mind? Like the member section of my video where people pay for it. I do a lot of private things now. Cause like, I'm like, look, if I'm putting my time in, right. I want to help out my subscribers, but it also helps me out. And it helps me put out better content. And I put in like the little secrets, the actual little secrets that go beyond, like hard earned secrets, basically. <laughs> like hard earned secrets. Like there's the basic yeah. secrets that everybody should have. And then there's some stuff like you really had to get in the gutter to learn that stuff. But mm-hmm. like I'll ask them, I'm like, yo, what do you want? Do you want something along these lines or do you want something along these lines? And even with that content, right? I want it. I don't want to keep, I don't want to string my subscribers along. I don't want to string my members along and give them half-assed information that isn't fully consistent. That's going to help the development as a player. Like what type of person would I be if I did that? That's terrible. That's how I view it. No, I'm going to put out a video. You're going to see what this is. I'm going to try to relate the information as articulate as I can. And what you get from that video is that you can keep coming back to it and you can keep trying what you see. You can slow-mo a video on YouTube, right? A lot of people, they've had a hard time hitting the pivot lunges, but now you see EK Spider hitting like pivot lunges all the time. Zayaf is hitting my, my style of pivot lunges, right? And his ESFO title fights, right? Nobody was doing that beforehand. 20K views, like, no, 16K views later, like now everybody's doing it. And that makes me so happy to see because now people are taking the knowledge that they see coming outside of their comfort zone of how they usually play the game and trying yeah. to create more action and trying to do more stuff to enjoy the game itself. So really, in a nutshell, it's like my consecration. I just want to help people get better, make sure like the information that they get, it's retainable and they can maintain that information. If not, they can co- always go back and it will reassert the same values that they, that they need to apply to their play style. And three, like, you know, just be able to have fun after you watch my video, you know, go online and rank and have some fun, like do some th- certain things. I'll have guys, they'll message me on Twitter. Like I have like, sometimes I, I can't get to all of them, but like, I'll see some of them and I'll be able to respond to them. Like, dude, I, one guy was telling me like, I hated this game. Like he's legit. I hated this game. I didn't want to touch it. I saw your channel. Now when I go play online rank championships, I'm trying to do this and that like you, or I'm, I, I'm trying to go there to try this stuff. And it makes me happy to hear because now you're not in this brooding mindset of I gotta fucking play rank and I gotta go do this and I gotta make sure I don't get subbed or something. Or now you're just having fun and then you're allowing yourself to flow and through that you become a better player. 
All right. So just one more thing uh, to expand upon. Uh, that seems to be my favorite word right now, expanding. Um, so again, there is a new player in town that has gotten a lot of people excited and a lot of um, interest that has been there. A lot of big names that are coming out of that game. And that is ESBC. I mean, uh, we are hearing good names coming out, but at the same time, there's a bit of skepticism when it comes to the release date that has been uh, forwarded a few times. Perhaps you could, uh, the reasons uh, of uh, trying to get the game right. There are a lot of reasons that are out there, but at the same time, it has all of our attentions and we are desperately waiting for something to come out like ESBC because we have not had a boxing simulator since Fight Night Champions or something of that quality. So again, um, we've had our previous guests talk a bit in detail about what they think, and we would like to hear some from you. Okay. So ESBC. So again, as somebody who's involved in like development, so basically someone involved in development and gaming, them delaying it is a good sign because they're trying to get out a better product. I do think it's going to be very important for them to have like a public type of alpha or beta because it's kind of like in UFC's case, right? We can have everything in, in place to have a, a MMA style game, which is for the most part does that pretty well for what it can do. But then you have other people that are like, I don't want to play a I don't want to do all this extra stuff. Let me see what's the cheapest way to win. Maybe if I just press these buttons together, somebody can get frame trapped and they can't move or something like that, right? So that's why it's really good to have like open testing, you know, like real good open testing, which is something I hope to see them do. Now, when, because it's a boxing game, right? So the the there's not going to be any concerns of kicks. There's not going to be any concerns of takedowns. Really, it's going to be mainly the footwork. They're going to have the, clin the, the brief clinches and everything, the immersion with that. Also, like certain variations in terms of boxing styles and whatnot, I think like that's gonna make it easier for them to develop them because they don't have to worry about all of those other extra things, right? Because in MMA, you have in an MMA game, you have to worry about all those extra intangibles and more. I would like to see them try and implement a vulnerability system because one thing that I like about the vulnerability system, and I think people don't really understand this, is that if you ever, you know what? After this interview, I want you to go and check out Kamara Usman versus Gilbert Burns, right? And you're going to pay attention to every single time that Usman drops Burns with a jab. And the key thing with vulnerability is that max vulnerability is either literally right as the startup, as when somebody's about to start up a yeah. strike, or generally at the end of the strike when you're like out of position. And sometimes it can be in the middle if you catch them at the right time. But those two moments of peak vulnerability are like good times. And what you see what boxers do really well, like Lomachenko, when he intercepts another boxer's rhythm, and he doesn't allow them to get set and ready, right? Like once they, they, they do like a little thing, right? And when they try to set their feet and go, Lomachenko's already intercepting them. So he's not letting them go like one, two, three, go. Like he's, stop, he's hitting them, boom, right before they can even yeah. get settled, yeah. right? And that's how I look at vulnerability. And if, you, and if you watch the fight with Kamaru Usman and Burns, right? You'll see it in live action, but Burns tries to leg kick him, tries to calf kick him, and Usman stuffs him with a stiff jab. And that jab does so much damage because he's on one leg, right? He's about to start up. He's about to put all his force into that. And then all that force is, boom, it's just crashing through his body. He's on one leg. He's a huge man. And he just took all that power at once. And that's how vulnerability works. So I think to have a really good boxing game, right? You don't want to have necessarily a game, right? I think, for example, a good fighter, a good boxer to bring up, Deontay Wilder, right? Mm -hmm. Massive power, right? But people talk about his power, right? But you have to kind of be in position to get those, to get those power mm -hmm. strikes. And there was a guy's name was the Cuban boxer. He was out boxing. Uh, he was getting outboxed. Deontay Wilder was getting outboxed for like seven rounds. And I, damn, I, I forgot his name. Uh, uh, <laughs> I forgot his name. Tyson but, Fury. No, 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 not Tyson Fury. It was the the Cuban. I'm talking about the fight that Wilder won. Like the fight. Oh, that he all right. Won. Oh, that one. Yeah. All right. I, yeah, I, I don't know the name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny because like he's a really he's a yeah. he's a phenomenal boxer, mm -hmm. and uh, he's a but basically Ortiz Ortiz that's his name Ortiz. Mm -hmm. So Ortiz is out boxing him for seven rounds. And all Deontay does, he set it up perfectly, right? He set it up. He starts circling behind his jab, right? Ortiz started following. And then Deontay timed him, caught him as he was about to go again and hit him right square on the forehead, come then knocked him out, right? Was that because of Deontay's power? Yes, of course. But he set it up accordingly. Yes. So I my biggest fear for the game would be like, oh, God forbid, you know, you go and you're striking, you're boxing somebody, and then you didn't even do anything to be necessarily vulnerable to get hit hard, but yeah. you just get touched once. And it's like, oh, yeah, the game decided this is a knockout. It's like, oh, God, that's so that would be terrible. Mm -hmm. Like, my excitement for the game is pretty high. I'll say it's about, like, a good seven or eight. Like, it's pretty good. 
because I know what it takes and it sees that they're really passionate about it. You know, they have the money clearly with all the fighters that they're licensing. But, but the key thing is gameplay. Like gameplay is what I, I want to see more player versus player gameplay. Like I think we've seen plenty of us can speak that we've seen plenty of showcases. I did get a notification from the Discord. It could be about something new that I haven't seen yet. So I might have to check it out. But I think seeing player versus player gameplay and then seeing how every all the systems work together is going to be really key on making sure this game has longevity. One, one little thing, though, like, I think a lot of people say, this game is going to kill EA, UFC, and my dude, EA is a billion-dollar business. <laughs> it's not going to kill anything. It will It's not going anywhere. <laughs> it's not going to go anywhere. The EA is not going to go anywhere because of one game. However, yeah. what it can do is that it can help EA see something that's being done in terms of certain things. Okay, how come we weren't able to have the tracking in this situation work like this, but they were able yeah. to do it with this dead engine? So as again, this comes down to ego, right? It's ego. Ego tells you, yeah, this is gonna beat this, this and that. A growth mindset and looking at things of like, oh, okay, we didn't get this right this time because we had whatever whatever numbers and the powers that be that have the game force, this magnetic stuff. We got to get rid of that, ma that magnetic invisible wall on UC4 and then have these realistic clinching, uh, clinch missions. I'm pretty sure ESBC does have like, when you get too close on a punch, like there's like a, there's a brief clinch that happens, right? I, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure I may have to go check the footage, but I'm pretty sure if my memory doesn't fail me. And that's something that's realistic and that and that's happened, that happens. And I think if you do that for yeah, you will see. Oh, whoo, whoa, 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 the things, the things I can already see flying through my head is just <laughs> about. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited for the game, and I'll definitely love to do content creation for the game. Like, like I'll definitely try and do content creation. Hopefully, it comes out on PS5, and I'll definitely have try to see how much time I can put in. Obviously, like once it's uh the season starts for me, like officially in eight days, so it's gonna be really. I'm gonna still do as much content that's possible mm -hmm. but this is priority like this is no more no more half this half this this is all in because your boy wants the victory but i'm definitely looking forward to ESPC. like you said um there's a lot of gratification that comes with content creation a lot of people who get inspired by uh by watching your content and that has to feel very satisfying to a certain level it goes to a certain level and um I personally think that for a lot of content creators, there must be other content creators out there who must have inspired that action or who you must have seen and must have see, uh, taken some inspiration from. Also, there must have been content creators uh, right now in this point in time uh, who whose content you would like to see from time to time. Other than that, there would be gamers that you're, you uh, <clears throat> are uh, currently engaged with, especially with your camp, and also individuals that uh, you would love to fight or you'd love to see. So uh, before we uh, close this interview for our final question, just a quick few shout outs that you would want to give to people who've inspired you or who you would like to see flourish even more. Heem the dream. I know he ain't uploading as much, but those of you who don't know, Heem was my first subscriber. And if I go back into my subscriber list, he is my first subscriber. He is one of my best friends, like since that came up through his community, obviously. Henry, a.k.a. Marshall Mayer, another guy has helped me out so much. He he was one of the biggest guys to push to get me on the Game Changer program, and I can't thank him enough for that. He's helped my channel out. Like, I remember the Rage video that he uploaded. Uh, oh, my God. <laughs> the Rage video means the beat. Uh, and I was like, well, even most of that was kind of laughing Rage, but he posted that, and then I got, like, some hate, some love, and I was like, oh, cool. Like, this is this is wild. So shout out to him. Obviously, shout out to everybody in dark camp, everybody in the camp. You know, the, the, the business go, business gonna get handled, whatever they gotta handle the business. And when and once I, God willing, win this NCAA title, I'll have a lot more time to uh get back into the swing of things for gaming. For now, like I plan on doing a stream a little bit after this and then just have some fun with like some of the ESFL guys, like just just laying it all out there, just having some fun. Uh let's see, obviously crooks. I mean, everybody in dark, so pretty much every Swiss, <laughs> Doc. Pre United, Pavaka, <laughs> freaking Zaya, uh, my boys, uh, all my boys in the dark. And if nobody else is going to know this, but I, my boys were the lads, the lads, everybody in that group chat and the lads, <laughs> the most competitive group chat I've ever been a part of in the ES, US, <laughs> USC community. All you guys are my brothers and I love all y'all. And who else? Who else? Honestly, there's a couple of people. You know, shout out ESFL Gaming. You guys are putting a lot of time, Zach Hunter especially, 
You guys have done a great job trying to trying to make a mess of all of these crazy individuals <laughs> that have love for this one game. And then allowing us to have this platform to showcase our skills. So really big, big shout out to ESFO Gaming. You guys have done a great job. Jeff Howard, I miss you. Come back. <laughs> but if you're not coming back to UFC, can you slide me a code for God of War Ragnarok? Because I really appreciate it. <laughs> but I'm sure I definitely missed out on a few people. But those are the first few people to come to mind. All right. I think if, if they were come to mind, just let me know. We're going to tag them on Twitter. Just our thoughts and prayers in those <laughs> in those comments there. Um, also, before we close the show here, uh, you're, I, I believe, uh, like you said, you're heavily involved in wrestling. You're mm -hmm. involved in content creation. There's a lot of other goals you must have in mind for yourself and for your future. So uh, for, for from now to for the next few years, uh, are there any tangible goals that you have in mind that you want to attain? Uh, if you could share them with us. Three years, let's see. So ideally, enter your title. Next thing is going to be fighting MMA and having myself a world title by the before I'm 30, ideally, before I'm 30. If it happens a little bit after, I ain't going to be too mad, but before I'm 30. I got a, I got some good connections that a few people know. Of. Like, you'll see pictures maybe in a month or two, maybe with a few, maybe one, two UFC champions that I may or may not be in connected, connected with now. But uh, let's say the, the future's looking bright. I just got to keep doing what I'm doing. And then God willing, you know, maybe I'll be on EA Sports UFC 7 or something. Who knows? <laughs> Well, if that comes to show, um, I think this interview is going to blow up even a few years out down the road. So we are very hopeful for that. Again, um, I believe uh, a lot of great things coming out of this conversation, a lot of insights uh, that I didn't previously know coming to light. So uh, really thankful to you, uh, Romero, for taking out the time. Again, I think we took our sweet time to get this done, but I'm really glad <laughs> yeah. that we were able to. Uh, with all the things that are happening in the background, my cat especially making all the noises, with the storm brewing uh, behind. I also had allergies. In fact, I did an interview with uh, Cody Dank a few days ago, and uh, I was absolutely out of my element with that. But a uh, shout out to Cody Dank for bearing He's with cool me too. for that. Yeah, sorry? He's cool too. Cody's cool. Oh, yeah. yeah. So uh, again, shout out to him. And uh, again, for everyone who's uh, uh, contributing to Game Kill, again, I cannot thank you guys enough for your support. We have, we have, we've been able to get guests like Romero, like Prioxis, and hopefully uh, other guys in this community and outside of this community as well. So uh, we're just going to continue uh, uh, putting on content. There has been there have been some difficulties, uh, especially when it comes to the setup uh, that I've had to put up. I, in fact, I showed Romero the background of what I'm doing right now. So it's, it's a little difficult at this point in time, but we're just going to uh, persevere. We're going to roll with the punches. And again, um, the reason why I've been able to do what I've been able to do with, with GameKale is again, uh, from all the support that you've gotten and also the fact that we've been able to have some really, really amazing conversations with individuals uh, from all spec uh, spectrums, um, from professionals working in offices, to people aspiring to be future world champions. Um, it's it's an amazing thing to do. And I think if nothing, that's that's a reward within itself. So again, uh, I thank you all for enabling me to have this experience. I thank all the guests that we have had, especially you Romero for taking out the time. And again, for everyone watching uh, again, uh, we would like to see you uh, on this channel. If you like what you're seeing, we're doing interviews week in, week out. We post at least one interview a week. So if you want to see something new, if you want to gain new perspective, um, all you have to do is just come to this channel and see what's going on. So uh, here's to seeing you guys again. And um, to all uh, who are watching this, this is Naveed and Romero signing off and hope to see you guys again. Peace. Good night.